1931, Cornell ventures into the newly opened Julian Levy Gallery. And Julian Levy was the first American dealer for the European Surrealists. And Cornell just happens to walk in there when a new show is opening up, the first Surrealist show in America. And it's there that he sees the paper collages, the first paper collages of Max Ernst. Uh, Max Ernst had done in 1929 what he called a collage novel. Imagine, you know, ahead of things this was. And uh, Cornell sees a number of these images in this show. And for Cornell, it's an epiphany. This work really speaks to him. It's like a door opens. And he, ha he has all this imagery at home. He has vast collections of 19th century European engravings. I mean, this exact stuff. And he starts to realize that he could actually make a form of art. He never even had considered that. So this is the turning point for Cornell, the early work of Max Ernst. And he really has a kinship with the with the Surrealists, the way they think and perceive the world. So uh, Cornell is so inspired that he goes home, and after he gets done with his day job, and when his mother and brother go to sleep, he sits down at the kitchen table at nights and starts to make his first portfolio of paper collages, which he brings back to Levy in a few weeks. And Levy thinks they're masterful. And within a year, Cornell is in a show at the Levy Gallery with Picasso. <laughs> now, you can't make this up. Right? You can't. It's, the guy never had an art lesson in his life. He's working out of his kitchen table in Queens. Timing is everything, right? So you can see here on the left, I mean, you can see why Cornell just gravitated to this. It's just, it really looks like a box, this particular one. The bird symbolism, the real surrealist thing. He was very into birds. He was a bird lover. He not only fed birds outside the house, in the morning he would open the kitchen windows and put the bird seat on the kitchen table. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the piece on the right, was that... So, oh, I'm sorry. The that was his. <laughs> it wasn't uh, an illustration. That was his actual... That was a he collage? Would take, it was collage. Oh, he, I, so well done. Yeah. So well done. You, it, they're really incredible. This is another one that was in that first show, one of his first collages. And um, the reason I show this, uh, not only because it's a great collage, it's a great so, surrealist image, but this... Uh, ties into his consciousness of his Dutch ancestry. And he was very aware of it. And throughout his work, there are many, many images that relate to um, <coughs> uh, boats, nautical navigation, all referring back to his great-grandfather, Commodore Voorhees. <clears throat> so there's a lot of imagery in ships in the sea in his work. Now, jumping ahead here to 1936, because of some of the artists that Cornell meets at the Levy Gallery, like Max Ernst and Marcel Duchamp, uh, they recommend the Alfred Barr, it's the Museum of Modern Art had just opened, and he wants to do his first Surrealist show. So some of the artists at the Levy Gallery suggest that he include Cornell. So Cornell is invited to do an exhibit in this show at the moment, 1936, very important show. And um, for the show, Cornell does what's one of the first installation pieces of art. It's like a combination of like 80 different objects set up in a, an exhibition case. And this is one of the objects in the case, which was his first shadow box, which became his signature style, which was the wooden box, the glass front, with collections of objects or images inside that related to both the natural and the artificial world. Um, so this is, this is a breakthrough piece. And you can see again, the knowledge of his Dutch ancestry, this is a Dutch clay pipe, which he used over and over in his boxes, referring to his background. But uh, more importantly, I just want to divert, divert a little bit here to an interesting side story. You can see these boxes, I don't know how clear this is, but the corners don't quite fit perfectly. I mean, let's keep in mind, Cornell not only never had an art lesson, 
but he didn't have to use tools. <laughs> he probably never used a tool in his life. And he suddenly has this idea to make a box. So this is a great, this is a great story. So what does Cornell do? Well, his next door neighbor, Carl Blackman, some working class guy, he knows has a wood shop in his basement. So he goes over to Carl, says, look, I want to make a box. I got this show coming up. Can you give me a hand? You know? So Carl says, yeah, okay, I'll help you out. And he, show, he helps Cornell make his first, probably a little miter saw, you know? And they make the first box. So where did Cornell get this inspiration to make these shadow boxes? Where did it come from? Well, there are a number of sources. There isn't really one. Um, one is clearly that uh, when he was working in New York as a salesman, his favorite museum was the Museum of Natural History. And he was constantly looking at things, exhibits through glass, wood <coughs> glass exhibition cases like this, with natural objects, collections of natural objects in them. Clearly something that inspired him. Also, Cornell himself says that it was the random, unrelated uh, correlation of storefronts that inspired him to make his first box with a glass front. That it was literally the storefronts that he was looking at all the time that was the box with the objects behind it. So that was another, and I will say this, <clears throat> this is just my opinion. But I think the New York of the 1920s and 30s was a much more eccentric place visually. Yes. There was a lot, lot more nuance and eccentricity. And it must have been amazingly stimulating to an artist. Um, so he was constantly stimulated by anything he saw on the streets. Uh, and then another source of, this is controversial, because Cornell had never admitted to this. But in 1934, because he had met Duchamp at the Levy Gallery, Duchamp asks Cornell to help him work on his uh, traveling museum cases, which was, this is called Box in a Museum. So Cornell worked on this before it was, became public, and it was before he made his soap bubble box. So it's possible that this also had a strong influence on it. Duchamp was always thinking in these kinds of terms. So it's, I'm sure this was another source of inspiration for Cornell. But there's one uh, source that I, that I feel is very, very much in his work and becomes the central influence for his work in the 1940s, which I think is his most original important work. Uh, and it doesn't get much play. And that is these. These are the original Penny Arcade boxes, games, from the arcades in New York at the time. They were all over the city. And Cornell, actually, you know, his, again, his child-like, uh, his child part, I know, you know, he loved these games. And he, the idea of putting a coin in a slot, and then something happens. And then something comes out the bottom. <laughs> That, he just was obsessed with that. And uh, <clears throat> this is clearly a major influence for his work. Um, and I think this is the tipping point where his work really becomes uh, something new, something different, something truly original in American <laughs> art. This is an amazing piece of art. There was nothing like this in American art at the time. It's taking, again, that combination of European history, culture, and mixing it with uh, low culture, if you will. Uh, you know, penny arcade games. And also, the influence of Duchamp, the incorporation of ready-mades, marbles, whatever he could find in dime stores, thrift stores, and including them in these pieces that were going in museums and fine art galleries. No one was doing this. So this, to me, is where he really leaps to another level and becomes one of the most original American artists of the 20th century to me, uh, clearly. <clears throat> and they're beautiful objects. Again, there's a crudeness to them. But you know, they're all made by the hand, just little hand tools. And uh, it, it's something that feels so differently than mass-produced items or fabricated pieces of, of art. Uh, so again, two more examples. A, an arcade game on the left and one of his boxes on the right. 
And the box on the right is actually called Swiss Shoot the Shoots. <laughs> so he never gets over this, you know? And again, there's nothing like this. It's just so unusual. And uh, uh, yeah, I don't know if, how many of you have ever seen, have you seen Cornell's boxes? Uh, yeah, they're not, they're not around a lot. They're very hard to see. They're mostly, yes? It's interesting you're yeah. talking about, you know, his woodworking, but yet as a craftsman, these are beautifully done. Exactly. I mean, those holes I mean, and the way oh, he no. crafted the paper. I've worked with <laughs> this guy. Yeah, I, yeah, it's very sophisticated work. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, here's another one I think is great. It's called uh, Forgotten Game in 1943. And Cornell would go through these great lengths of um, getting these objects to look old, weathered. So literally, like in this one, he'd put... I don't know how many coats of enamel paint on it, let it dry, and then he would literally put it in the oven and let it bake at a low temperature. So until it would crack and turn yellow, or sometimes he would just leave them out in the driveway. These boxes at this point were worth a lot of money. <laughs> he leave them out in the driveway, you know. And by the way, even when he was at his height of fame, he stored all of his boxes in the garage. <laughs> this is true. And actually, there was an incident where uh, one of the women that he got involved with, a waitress, who turned out to have a drug issue, did steal boxes from the garage. And this was a big case. And um, she was apprehended. And Cornell would not press charges because he was such a, a true gentleman. And now, you know, I can't, can't go into everything about Cornell tonight, but he really. <clears throat> Uh, so untypical, the art world. Another one of his great boxes. You know, uh, so, so original. Based on a shooting gallery. Um, so it combines his love of naturalism, his love of birds. But this is one of the few pieces that Cornell did that shows distress, danger. Uh, he shattered the glass. I don't know if you can see that. Yes. And there's a hole. So it's the one, the only boxes he did like this, and in fact, he almost, um, he's using this kind of expressionist paint splatter. This is in the 1940s. So again, for him, it was just totally intuitive. You know, all this stuff was totally intuitive. Uh, and again, I think it, with these boxes, this is just truly original American art. There's nothing else to say about it. You know, it just... Hmm. There's nothing else like it. There was nothing else like it. You don't feel that that's connected to Max Stern's thing for the broken sheets of glass for Peggy Goodman? Beautiful observation. I don't, that's a really good, it's absolutely possible. Yeah. yeah. He knew the piece. Yeah. It was close to Duchamp. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. With that one? Yeah. Part of the thing it would be a coincidence, right? right? Yeah, I agree with you. Absolutely agree with you. Now, that's another great, I love this collage. I mentioned how he made a box for a ballet dancer and he got connected into the dance world. He was very close friends with uh, Tyler Parker. I don't know if anybody knows that name. He was a very interesting character. He was a co-editor of this surrealist publication, View Magazine, in New York in the 1940s. Uh, he went on to become a, the first underground film critic. And he was very close friends with Cornell. He loved Cornell. And he was one of Cornell's early supporters when, because Cornell did suffer from tremendous insecurity because he did have no art training. And he never really felt on firm ground, you know? And uh, Parker Tyler was one of the few people who said, no, this is great, you're doing great work, you keep doing it. And he would hire Cornell as a commercial uh, illustrator to do these collages. And I love this collage because, again, this is Cornell with Americana. Uh, you get, you know, King Kong. Uh, sure. Now, and when he's referring to an Indian chief here, he's not talking about <coughs> indigenous Americans. This is because he went to the Wild West show with Buffalo Bill <laughs> in New York, you know? That's his reference. You know, somebody walking across Niagara Falls. Uh, the only thing that's missing here is Houdini, Tim. I don't know why I didn't yeah. Houdini in here, but I, I'm not sure if that is Houdini, actually, over there on the right. I think there's even here a reference, it's hard to see, but I think it's an ape carrying a damsel in distress. Yeah. So this is real uh, pop art, really. This is pop art in the 1940s. 
It wasn't called that, but that's what it is. Cornell is invited to um, do a private screening of Rose Hobart, which is the first film of collage he did, starring the actress that nobody remembers anymore, Rose Hobart. She was a studio player. She did play opposite Frederick March in 1934, uh, Jekyll and Hyde. So she was up there for a while. <coughs> but she declined and started making these real B, C movies. And he had film reels from, he had a copy of this movie, East of Borneo, like a B jungle thing that she was in. And he made it into a surrealist uh, film, like a seven minute surrealist film. He spliced it, got rid of the narrative, it incorporated uh, images from other movies. <coughs> he put his own score of Brazilian music. <laughs> he showed it through a blue filter. So the story is, he's showing this movie at the Julian Levy Gallery to a crowd like this. And coincidentally, it's Dolly's first time in New York. And he's, in this, he's at this screening. And um, the story goes that Dolly in the middle of this projection, storms out of his seat with his cape and cane and starts yelling uh, at Cornell in his face. I mean, just really, you know, screaming at him. And he takes his cane and knocks the projector off the table and it basically accuses Cornell of stealing his idea. Yeah. Now, he, had, he, 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 he dreamed the idea and Cornell stole it from him. <laughs> This, again, Cornell was such a like timid soul. He was mortified and never showed a movie again. Oh. He was completely destroyed by this. Completely oh. destroyed. Do you know what year that was? Yeah. That would have been, uh, I think, 1936? Yeah. 1936. Yes. Does that film still survive? You can go on YouTube and watch it. Oh, oh really? All right. Right. I think they have sections. I don't even watch the whole thing, but yeah, you can, you can see it on YouTube. I'm jumping to another thing here. This is, because uh, we're in Nyack, it is the winter. Um, I just saw this Cornell box recently at the New Whitney. It's called Winter Palace. Sometimes it's called uh, Scene for a Fairy Tale. And it's usually interpreted by art critics, art scholars, that's another surrealist, European, dreamlike piece. But I, I think that, again, maybe Cornell is going back to his youth, his happiest years of his life, and he's really talking about the mansion at South Florida. That was his winter palace. That was his scene for a fairy tale. And you can only imagine as a young child being at the top of that turret in a, in a blizzard looking down at the Hudson River. You know, what could be more dreamlike, yeah. right? And uh, that's the house that was torn down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, he always talked about this house. He could describe details throughout the house. Mm. Um, can you imagine losing that? Mm. And this is where he wound up. Mm. Mm. This is the house on Utopia Parkway that he has spent his entire adult life with his mother and brother. And he worked in the cellar the kitchen and the garage and back. 